great progress. So we're going to step into looking a little more specifically at what those rock star caregiver characteristics are if you're using the intent of trying to nurture your relationship with your kiddos. So the first one is response quality. We're going to talk a little bit about what does it look like when it's successful and what does it look like when it's unsuccessful. So obviously successful would be that you're responding promptly and appropriately if it's unsuccessful when the child's trying so hard to get your attention, you're not responding. The funny thing was, the other night, I was, or day, I was in the grocery store, and this little girl was in the candy aisle with her mom, and she was saying, she was sitting in the car, you know, those car grocery cart things, and she was saying, I want gummies, I want gummies, mom. And her mom said something, wasn't looking at her, had no eye contact, was halfway down the aisle, said something like, uh, we don't, we're not getting those, or I'm looking for the kind we're getting, or something. And she kept saying, I want gummies, I want gummies, I want gummies, I want gummies, I want gummies. And this went on for minutes. I actually stayed in the aisle to just see how long it would take before the mom responded. She actually never did. But the point was, all she had to do was say, you really want gummies. She didn't even have to say why they weren't getting them, but just to acknowledge the fact that this child was trying to get her attention on a specific question. But she literally tuned her out and was just shopping down the aisle. It was fascinating to me. I just <laughs> stood there and watched, pretended I was shopping for candy too. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, obviously it's not going to be that we can drop everything but are we being appropriate with our response quality? Are we just letting kids know, I'm finishing this activity right here and I will be right over to help you with what you're doing. That's being a responsive caregiver. That synchrony piece, it's reciprocal and rewarding. Are you doing the same thing? Remember that lady was looking at the flowers with her baby? You know, are you trying to do something and the child's playing something else? That's not building the relationship because you're not taking the lead. We're not taking the time to do the same thing. So that synchrony piece is just taking their lead and doing it together. Um, mutuality, that joint attention, same kind of piece. We're doing it. We're enjoying it. Uh, the synchrony piece also relates to, remember when we looked at those pictures of affect? You know, they're matching. Go ahead. The positive attitude, <clears throat> the positive affect. I mean, the ideal is you have a calm <coughs> face, a happy face, an approachable face um, for your children. The unsuccessful piece would be that opposite. The mom was totally tuned out. She wasn't looking at the child at all. Um, or the other thing is, have you ever seen adults when they're talking to kids and they're really mad at them, but they're talking to them like this? I, I think it's not okay what you're doing right now. I mean, kids can read that. They know. They know you're not being genuine and you're not building a relationship. If you're mad, say you're mad. That stimulation piece, I mean, are you just participating in the play? Are you adding something? Are you providing something that's interesting for them to do so that they want to have that relationship with you? Or the opposite would be, you know, are you stuck, stuck on your phone all the time and <coughs> they're trying to interact with you but you're not providing that stimulation back? <clears throat> and support, are you just available? Are you around? Can you be dependable? Can you be constant? The funny thing is when we are available to kids, they don't really need to act out to get our attention because they know that if they need us, they're there. My kids know I will always be there to pick you up at school. My kids never had a problem saying goodbye <coughs> or you know, getting picked up. It was never a concern. There were other kids who it was very traumatic for because it wasn't consistent. They didn't know if their parent was always going to be available. But I'm not ever not going to be there. And if I'm not going to be there, you're going to know and you're going to know why. So. Same thing goes for the babies, even. So this is just a piece to remind us what we talked about last time about temperament. What we want to focus on is that we need to be aware of our own temperament, and we need to be aware of the child's temperament 
so that we can make adjustments to create that attachment piece. Because really, when temperament and attachment go together, that's affecting our relationship. It's either going to go good or it's not going to go well. So this is just a little refresher. The attachment is the continuing and lasting relationship with the young children. Um, it refers specifically to the adult-child relationship, their sense of security and safety when they're with a particular adult. Sometimes we forget about that. We can't do anything if kids don't feel safe. Okay, so these are a few <coughs> videos that we're going to watch. Um, there's three. One that's for babies, a baby. One that's for um, a toddler. And one that's for a preschooler. Yes? Um, if you want to pull it up. Yeah. So the first one is with an infant. And we're going to talk a little bit about what do you see um, in the video? What do you notice about the interaction? What kind of caregiving do you see from the adult? And how does that influence the child? But we're really going to focus on the adult. Actually, oh, this is fun. Is it that one? It's the one with the little baby on the lap and the mom's reading. Yeah, that one. We'll start, we'll start young and we'll age up to it. into a little bit more, but she was self-talking, she was telling what she was doing, she was parallel talking, telling what he was doing, right? Mm -hmm. And he was telling her some stuff, wasn't he? Yeah. And how did she respond to that? You, you, I heard you say it. He give was saying, give back. me that book yeah. back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he knew what he wanted and she was willing. And she gave it back to him, right? She, she wanted to read the book, silly her. <laughs> um, he wanted to chew on the book and she did let him lead that play. He got to lead it and be in charge, and she followed his lead when she heard him making a protest. Um, and the other thing was, you know, she had a nice body position. She, she, he could see the book, and she could look over, so she wasn't obstructing his view. So it was a nice, comfortable um, position. And again, they were touching. Um, not that one, the one with the mom on the couch. Yeah. This is my favorite one of all time. Really put yourself in this video spot. Could you do this? Toddlers are my favorite people on the planet. And this mom does a really nice job as well. Can you open the rest? She's trying to open a fruit strip. Almost. Almost. 
first. Keep trying. Get ready. Can I help you? Can Mama help? Okay. 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 Almost, almost. Do you want Mama help? You're making projects. And her words, she asked, would you like help? She didn't just say, here, let me help you, right? You know, you are taking way too long. Um, what else did you notice about it? I think she does a really nice job. The little girl had she was yeah. persisting and she wanted to do the job and did mom sabotage that at all? Oh. So that at the end, when the child finished it, who felt victorious? She did, right? Yeah. Very proud. So proud. And the mom, one of the things that I think is almost most important that we often forget as adults is to celebrate those little mini successes. She's building that relationship with that little girl because she let her try and then she celebrated it with her. So they have that shared connection now. Remember when I had to open that group roll up and I, you know, they have a memory because of it. But she, she did a really nice job. Okay, this one is with a um, preschooler. Not that. The, 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 yeah. I was thinking we can have a slime party. Oh, that sounds like fun. I used to have those when I was little. Wow. Pajama parties. <laughs> yeah, we'd have pizza and stuff, you know. We used to have pizza. I had pizza at the center. At the center? Yep. Is it from the pizza place or does the lady make it? The lady make it. We watched a Spongebob movie. Yeah? Yeah. I didn't see that. How is it? Great. Yeah? Brilliant. Tell me about, tell, can you tell me about the story? Because I don't know anything about it. Because I don't have little kids at home to watch this stuff. So, you all have to tell me what's going on. Well, I'll tell you about the stuff eating. Okay, go ahead. Enjoy. What happened? They are talking about the house area, and the block area, and the computer, and the running area, and the pen area, and... We don't have art down there, but that's our studio. Is that the after school place and, you go to? Yeah, and they get sand, <laughs> and they parking the door we get. But who's this bed? This class or the after school? This class. Why? Because I like it with Janelle was here and Rita and Miss Delphi. Okay. <laughs> so so what do you do there? What do you do there? Well, I can tell you the stuff they got. What do they got? They got red. Blue, green, and some more plants and gold. Yeah. And the same cup. Yeah. Also, they don't use paper when they eat. They have regular cups and stuff. Yeah. For the house area. Oh, they have the same ones as us? Yup. They have coffee in them with everything. <laughs> and the, the other one, the kiddo work and the other one. Well, that will be We're going to try to get it fixed. I'm going to ask, okay? Because it's hard to wait and turn, huh? Who's over there on the rug? And Miss Bella? Miss Bella and Miss Elizabeth. Oh. So, but you have a good time there, right? Yeah. Yeah? I don't think, you know, I don't think they're really copying us. I think
think they just they know what children like to play with. So they have the same stuff. What's your favorite thing there? Um I'll tell you what's my favorite toy. What's your favorite toy? Um Lego with my teacher and myself. Oh, what about the after school? What do you like there? So you made new friends already? Yeah. Oh, I think that's because they're a wonderful little girl, huh? Mm -hmm. you, have they been there for a long time? Yeah. Yeah. So they helped you out with like the rules and stuff? Yeah. Or oh, do they have the same rules as us? Yeah. Same? Yeah. They're old ones. They're old ones? And they're trying to copy us with their brand new ones. Yeah, do you remember when we talked about if someone copying you, that means they must like what you're doing, so it's okay? So they must think that we're really good here, huh? Yeah, yeah you think so? All right, what do you think about that video? <laughs> Comments? What did you think she did well? Engaged in conversation. She did. She spent a lot of time at the table with her, didn't she? Mm -hmm. And she was doing the same activity that she was doing. Mm -hmm. They were kind of playing together. She was actually picking the play out of the tool. But, but she was participating in the activity with it. What about the conversation? Did you notice anything specific about the conversation? Well, I like that she didn't say, oh, well, we're better than that. Yeah. Yeah. And she kept it positive. Yeah. She kept it positive. She worked in some nice alternative ways of thinking about things for the child. I like how she let the child change topic and she just followed right along. She didn't skip a beat. She just continued. The flow was really nice. Super flow. I mean, she followed that child's lead from a slumber party to the after school to her friends over here. I mean, she, she wandered the whole way with her and it just rolled right along. The only thing that some people would critique on that one was she asked a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Some of them weren't necessarily open-ended, so she was definitely a chatty person, but probably if you critiqued it in any way, that would probably be the only thing that she asked a lot. Well, I thought her affect at one point, though, the kid was pretty calm and she was acting over, and I almost felt like it was maybe just a little touch too much because you're supposed to, like, in a mirror where they're at, and I thought she, but that was the only thing that I thought. I agree. Because sometimes when we get too loud, you know, or over where they are, it shuts kids, it shuts that seem natural. Down. Well, it didn't seem natural, and I think it's because people were, were videotaping. You can yeah. tell that she was so aware of that. Yeah. And actually, I thought it was much more natural as it progressed. It, she forgot about the video being yeah. there, but I think that she was nervous. Yeah. I think, and I you saw the microphone. Sure. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think her over-exaggeration was a, a sign of nervousness. So. Right. Yeah. And I can tell you from having been <laughs> it is super awkward. Um, okay, we'll go back to the slides. That one's for later. So, okay, so we're going to get into the communication piece and exactly what words we're saying. And this is kind of what we started talking about last time when you asked about how we can rephrase the no stop and don't. So we need to teach children, they can learn when we learn to understand what children are communicating and listening. We need to know whether they're talking or not. What are they really telling us? And we need to be in a place where we can listen to figure it out. Because all of those problems, will, that, you know, situations that we had with the dolls, we needed more information. So if we're constantly leading the, leading the scenario, doing all the talking, telling kids what to do, we don't have the, that, that observation time to listen to them, to find out that that little guy, he came to tell her he needed a squeeze. And if we're always running the show, then we're not enough place to do it. So I'm going to pass this out. It's actually from the... Um, taxi website, but it's a way, it's instead of saying don't run, you can say use your walking feet or stay with me or hold my hand. And then it also has another column that's a reminder, which is awesome because sometimes we forget 
to say, way to go, or I like how you're walking right now, or thanks for using your walking key. Uh, so hopefully that helps um, as a little reminder. Um, but we're going to get in a little more to what that communication piece looks like. I'm going to not spend a whole lot of time on it just because you have the slide. I think this goes through each age and what their communication means. So for a very newborn infant, their communication is just them becoming interested in others and needing attention. And what does that look like? They cry, they smile, they make sounds. And why do they do that? Because they need to protest things. They need to express distress. They need to request things. Um, so we can follow this as kids get older. When they're getting older, they are starting to talk to you with that babble piece. They can, 12 to 18 months, they're starting to crack that language code and saying those single words. But they're talking for the same reasons that you and I talk about. They're just not having as many words to draw on. Their vocabulary isn't as deep. When they get older, they're starting to pair those words. 18 to 24 months, we'd see those two or three words because their first two to three is when that vocabulary is just growing by the day and they're using it to communicate. They want to begin chatting. Um, two to three, now they're talking more in sentences. They're asking those why questions. They're trying to figure things out. They want to tell stories. They can get into that dramatic play because they have the imagination. Now they're being able to express their feelings. Words and communication become a whole new ballgame when you're at two to three. And when you're three to five, I mean, they're taking turns. They're learning to talk. And they're using their words to think, learn, and imagine, not only in the present, but they can talk about what happened Last month, they can predict or talk about something they're excited about in the future. So you can just see how that communication piece swells, and it's our job to support them where they are on that on this continuum. This one is a video that we're going to watch. It's just super funny. I don't know if you've seen it. It's been on social media, but it just goes to show us that even without real words, we don't we don't need to. I mean, these children are having a full, intense conversation um, without needing a lot of Oh, sorry,
they they like they imitated. They, loved him. they were also they were mirroring a lot, but they were actually following fairly conventional social yeah, yeah, rules for yeah. communicating, right? He talked, then there was a pause, then the other one would say something. The one that you weren't facing, yeah, they used arm gestures, body motions. The one that was on the left, he did you notice his voice? He would he actually mimicked an adult. I have a question. Yeah, the yeah. inflection of yeah. his voice. And they used their gestures like, I'm going up, you're going up. And they, and they really took all the social conventions that we would want kids to pick up. It just didn't have the words yet. But they had a full on conversation and enjoyed that. So. so the next section that we're going to talk about is making deposits. And it was our trivia question. Um, a lot of you marked 10, it's actually 5, well, you could shoot for 10, I think that's a good one. But Lori and Dee Dee actually put 5. So I drove, Vanessa Drew went out and well, Dee Dee's the official winner because we just did a drawing. Um, so your prize today is some Play-Doh. Because I actually think Play-Doh is a fantastic activity for building a relationship with a kid. It's a nice solitary, open-ended activity, and I know myself, I felt like you really make a connection with a kid. It's easy for them to leave that play and take it from where they want to go with Play-Doh. Um, so, congratulations. And good work. Can I say something real quick about Sure. It? My grandson, uh, Mido, we were playing Play-Doh, and he's learning his words. He is three and he, instead of saying frustrated he says nervous <laughs> and who knows where he got nervous nobody even we don't know none of us say that <laughs> miles kara none of us we don't know where he came up with it so we're playing play-doh he says mimi you make me so nervous <laughs> and it was all over play-doh and i love play-doh because it is just like that they say things and their mind is just going yeah. so i just want to say that but this <laughs> concept of making deposits is actually one of the most critical pyramid strategies that you're going to learn and it's something that will get referenced over and over again without this foundational piece of positive language you're not going to make any inroads with kids you really just aren't. And what we've come to find from research is that this five to one ratio is imperative. And it's really a time of reflection for adults. If we're not giving five positive statements to a kid before we make a withdrawal, and we're going to talk about what a positive and negative statement look like, but if we don't do that, we're not, we're emotionally draining a kid to the point where they're not invested in that relationship with us. And that we're, with these deposits, we're giving attention when the child is engaged in appropriate behavior, when they're using that walking feet. When you notice that little girl comes and gets you, holds your hand and brings you over, that's the time to make a deposit. That's the time, when that little boy uses a big boy voice, even though normally we would just expect it and not say anything about it, that's the time to make a deposit. It's our job as, to, as adults to front load these kids' emotional piggy banks as full as we can get them. So when we need to make a withdrawal, if we need to make a draw, withdrawal, we're not bankrupting them emotionally. The test questions, that's what I was talking about a little bit with that lady. We'll get into it in the next slide, but test questions are asking kids things on the spot a lot of times it's something they already know. Penny, what color is this time? Blue. What's this? What color is my phone? Parents do this all the time. If you're asking a kid a question that only has one answer, it's a test question. And it actually is a withdrawal from their emotional pain. Our goal is to be giving them an open-ended question. If you need to ask the question because you truly, as an educator, need to know, does Penny actually know her color? Does she know that this is blue? Then that has relevance and importance. But if we're bombarding kids all the time with questions that only have one yes or no answer, 
or one specific answer about colors. It's like sometimes parents come into my room and they just want to kind of show their kid off or prove that they know things and they're like, you know, how many water bottles are on the table, Penny? Tell, tell them, tell them, how many water bottles are on the table? And it just, when you put kids on the spot like that, I mean, maybe their temperament is they they don't work well under that pressure or they're shy. You're, you're taking away from their emotional stability and stronghold. You look like you're questioning me a little, do you not? Well, I'm just, tell me I'm what you're just thinking. trying to think about it in context if, if I do that. Because when we go places in the van, I always ask them, what are the rules before we get out of the car? But that's not and a test question. Saying, it is a test question because I want to have the same response every single time. That's okay. That's setting an expectation. That's letting them know what are the rules. But there's not just one answer. There's probably several rules, correct? But for me to say, Dee Dee, what's this number? What's this number, Dee Dee? And not let it go, that's a test question. You're putting a kid on the spot. You also didn't say, so and so, what is the rule, right? You're in the van driving. No, we're in the van. We're stopped. Well, we, we get in the van. I ask the same question. Okay, we're going out today. What are the rules? No running off and stay with Danny and they all laugh. Oh. And then it's the same thing, you know, before we get out of the van when we're stopped. Because if they don't stay with me and then they run off, we'll have a death. Right. You know, we're in the park with that. So. Well, A, that's safety. We're going to always but it's, trump it's for safety. But it's repetitive. It's really repetitive. Repetitive is not the same as a test question, though. I mean, we go through every day, what do we do at circle? Well, These are the rules. It sounds like you're asking the big group too that you're not yeah. putting one kid. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, Penny, what's the rule? What's you know? That and she could different. say no running. She could say hold your hand. There are a lot of different answers she could give. It's not one right answer, and that's what we're talking about. That kind of test question where you're putting a kid on the spot in front of other people, and it's like shameful if you don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. We don't want to shame anybody. And the verbal demands is the same thing. Sit down. I mean, that's just, we're demanding something of a kid when we can rephrase it into a different way so that it's an emotional deposit instead of a withdrawal. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So here are some kinds of deposits that you can make. It kind of goes from quietest to more chatty, I would say. But the act of listening is called soul. It means silence, observation, understanding, and learning, I think. Um, but it's basically just not talking and watching and listening. That's actually a deposit for a kid. Just, <coughs> we're just giving them attention, right? And being quiet and not saying anything so that they can be in charge of that interaction. Playing with them, huge deposit. Getting down on their level, getting on the carpet with them and playing even more. One-on-one -on -one time, sitting at the Play-Doh table and having that little interaction, giving each child that chance to work with you one-on-one -on -one is a huge deposit. Giving them wait time. We're adults. We're in a hurry. We have a lot of things to do. We have a lot of things on our mind. Usually when we ask a question of kids, we want them to answer it or do it immediately, right? But what we got to remember is they're little, and the time it takes for them to A, hear what you said, and then put it in their brain, process what you said, like, let's do walking feet. Use your walking feet. First, they have to hear me, put it in their brain. Then they have to process that. Use your walking feet. Whoa, what does that mean? What does that mean? Where are my feet? You know, I mean, kids need seven to nine seconds just to figure out what you said before they do anything. How many times do adults give kids seven to nine seconds? Not very often. But when you do, that's a deposit. Because giving them the time to think and be independent, be confident and in control of that situation. Because if we say use your walking feet and they haven't started doing it, maybe they were supposed to be walking, and we're already, hey, I said use your walking feet, or you know, let's go. We've already started making withdrawals before we even gave the child a chance 
to do it. And it could have turned into a really awesome deposit, but if we're impatient, it ends up being a withdrawal. Mirroring that same piece where we're doing what they're doing, self-talk is that same piece where we've been watching in some of the videos where she was saying what she's doing, just narrating. I'm going to go get a drink because I'm thirsty or um, I have two toys and I think I'm going to give one to Annie because she doesn't have a toy to play with. Just kind of narrating what you're doing. Parallel talk would be the same thing but you're narrating what the child is doing. And sometimes that's a great way to prevent uh, escalating behavior by narrating what you're seeing and they're doing because you're setting up the stage for them to make a better choice. It's a great tool. Um, reflection are kind of those I wonder statements like I wonder what are the rules when we go outside of the van I wonder that's a great way to ask a question without it being a test question because you're just thinking hmm, I wonder and there's no pressure to answer because you're just wondering and they might say something right expansion that's when you're taking what they say, if they're maybe an infant, and they say, cup, cup. And you say, oh, the red cup. You want the red cup. And you're just adding on one word. And modeling, same thing, where you're taking something that they're doing, maybe you're rephrasing it or modeling it in a way that would be um, appropriate for them. The withdrawals are the no's, the don't, the stops, the demands or making the directions, the test questions like we talked about, the loud voice. Can you hear the people who are taking care of your kids in another room? If you can, it's too loud. The only voice you should really be hearing at top level is the kids. And I think what we're recommending is you're at their level or you're below. Years ago, I worked for a gal. She was actually one of the pastors at my church. And she had the greatest demeanor with her girls. But she was amazing. I can remember her picking up her girls, and she'd sit on the step, and she'd talk and they would listen. If she had something that she really wanted them to hear, she would sit down and get on their level, and she would talk really quiet like this. It's a and fantastic And it was just like, wow, that was really mindful to see that interaction that she yeah. had with her. Because really, adults' natural reaction when people aren't listening or they want control is to go higher. But the fact of the matter is, exactly that like you said, awesome. if you go lower, you're actually more likely to get their attention. Did you have something to say? No. Um, but, I mean, we have some people, some, we have a gentleman that works, and he's just a vivacious, really gregarious, outgoing guy. But when he comes into our toddler classroom, sometimes it can be, it's, very overwhelming for kids and they actually shut down and they cry and they don't want to be in the room because it's too, it's too loud much. Yes, too much. especially for those sensory kids i mean yes. think about those temperaments of the kids that we've been talking about who don't deal well with the big loud sounds and the bright lights and things like that we are shutting them out of that whole interaction by being too loud <coughs> um, intimidation and sarcasm i mean as adults, we can think we're being funny or talking to another kid, but when we do those things, we are really just pulling some money right out of their little deposit. So here are some other things that we can do to add on to positive <coughs> interactions. We can acknowledge their communication. They could be an infant, and we could say, oh, you're trying to talk to me, and you know, saying, we're acknowledging the effort. We can acknowledge that that little girl wants your attention. We could turn it into a positive, the screaming. We really could. Oh, you want help. We greet children by name. We engage in one-to-one -one at their eye level. The pleasant, calm voice with simple language. Not talking too fast. And really thinking about developmentally where are those kids with respect to language and using that amount of words. You know, if you're with a two-year-old, how many words should you be putting in your sentence versus if you're with five-year-olds? If you're with a speech-delayed kid, you know, you're going to back off how many words you're putting into a sentence. The warm, responsive physical contact. 
Um, following the child's leads and interest during play, these all put the pauses in their piggy bank. Um, listening to them, encouraging them, like that little mom did when the girl was opening her thing. Um, acknowledging them, that they listen to others. You know, transposing these skills onto other kids. When you see Sully doing it to somebody else, that's another chance to make a deposit. Because you noticed him doing it not just with adults, but with his peers. Um, Acknowledging the child's accomplishments. I can tell you, you could get a double deposit by acknowledging that child's accomplishments to someone else in the room. When mom comes to pick him up, you wouldn't believe what Johnny did today. Can you believe that he took this toy and shared it? He tapped his friend on the shoulder. I mean, that's a double dose of banking some emotional deposits for the child. So we need to be aware that we're constantly finding ways to acknowledge their hard work, but when we do it in front of somebody else, it's like double dipping. Considering their needs and interaction styles like we just talked about with regard to temperament or their delays and the cultural, linguistic, and ethnic backgrounds of the child, you know, being really sensitive to that, um, having fun with it and praising it, turning it into something cool, that diversity can be a huge deposit, that's something you're finding to celebrate rather than not mention or different is not good. So one of the strategies for just keeping this in the forefront of our mind is giving attention when they are engaging in the appropriate behavior. If they're not getting in the appropriate behavior, we're going to get into this later, but we're going to redirect them or we're going to ignore it. We want to give them more attention for good behavior than they're getting with bad. If you do, if that's that funny, little girl you gets your attention, ignore it. that's fine that you say that. Or redirect. I mean, most of the time I would say we redirect, especially for the younger population. But if it's something that could be ignored, it's not a safety hazard, mm -hmm. let it go. Hmm. That Cheerio thing, Jessica ignored it. That was fine. That was an inappropriate behavior that Sully was obviously trying to get some attention for. And she didn't give him any. So is he going to stomp on the Cheerios tomorrow? Probably not. Right? And she has an opportunity to build on it lap next time. But that's a great example of just ignoring. It wasn't life-threatening. It wasn't a big deal. She can let it go so that he doesn't get rewarded for that behavior choice. And maybe next time she can do something else. But she didn't withdraw. She, didn't, she made a deposit, actually, by just Monitor our behavior to ensure that we are spending more time using positive descriptive language and less time giving directions. Honestly, it's just a frame of mind. It's just practice. And once you're really in it, you'll never not be able to be in it. And you will notice all the time when people are not in it. But you'll become champions and advocates for it, and you can teach other people how to do it. You can teach the kids how to do it, which actually I think is the most empowering thing of all is you can be raising this generation of people who just talk positively um, and it's not to say that there aren't times to feel heady emotions but we can handle it all in a positive way and that above all I think is most impactful. And going on with Brooke said when we first did this um, I went home and just tried it with Jared and he was so worried he'd done something wrong because in this world we're so used to that negative language. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you, take this and go home and use it with people in your home. And watch the reaction. It's so wild how as adults we're so used to negative. Where it would be great to, instead of those fights you have, it's just a positive spin on everything. I love it. <laughs> what I really like is the waiting, you know, waiting for the kids because Sometimes when I'm thinking, and someone asks, well, I have this one particular kind of way, but we'll have a conversation, and she'll ask me something, and I'll pause to think about what she asked me, and she'll fill in all the blanks. Yeah. And by the time she's done, I really don't have an answer because she's already interpreted what I think I'm going to say. Yeah. And um, the other thing is the teenagers. You know, when you give them a task, I'm so guilty of this. I'll say, so like after you take out the trash, you know, Will you, will you pick up the bathroom and then when you're done with that, that laundry sitting in there and, you know, have five tasks for them to do. Oh, for James, he's the last one at home. And he'll go, 
I lost you at the first one. You want to tell me, you know, I can't, and he can't. No. But that's a great point, especially about the waiting time. It's something so often overlooked, and people get really uncomfortable with silence. I, I could honestly sit in my classroom, and I could not say a word the whole time. I could let them figure it out. It doesn't bother me at all. I'm happy. And we've actually really been focusing on teaching the kids to respect that quiet time. We call it thinking time. And we have some of the little guys, they'll get up and they just want to do it and they're like, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, because they're supposed to be passing something out to a friend and they're trying to decide who it is, so they'll just say, I'm thinking. But that's, we're giving props to that, we're celebrating that time, that you are thinking, you're, you're being thoughtful and we're going to give you that space and time to think. So it's something we can teach kids as well to, to model. Um, Don't you think it helps them to listen too, that's to their classmates? Yeah. Because they're pausing for them, you know, so it's going to be reciprocal. Especially for those kids, think about the really quiet ones. I mean, sometimes they cannot get a word in edgewise, and they don't get as much out of it as the chatty ones who are constantly talking. And so if you're teaching that respectful piece of waiting, you're allowing the kids who might otherwise get overlooked to participate in the conversation and feel part of the group and contribute their ideas. You know, the generation now, our granddaughter is in fifth grade, and just this just happened on Saturday. We were talking, and we just paused. Nobody talked. It was just me and Grandpa and her, and nobody was talking. It was just like three minutes. Mm -hmm. And she goes, awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we are. We're old, you know, and I look at Grandpa. Grandpa looks at me, and I'm like, and, and so then, you know, Mike's very boisterous, and he's like, what's awkward? She's like, uh, silence, awkward. You know, and it's... It's like, some people, it's and, very And now I'm sitting here going, oh my goodness. Yeah. But I think what you'll find is when you put it into practice, what you get from the kids is really powerful. So some people have trying to put visuals up for themselves as adults to remember. This is an example of a school. They put the bars over just the no-stop domes. This one tried to make it a little more positive. They put a happy face. Just as a little visual as you're in your room to remind you, let's keep it to the positive. Um, this is another one, go ahead, with piggy banks. It's a little hard to see, but they put something about deposits and withdrawals, and they put little ideas on the little pennies. And I have a little gift for you today. I made you all little piggies that I laminated so that you too can maybe hang it somewhere in your um, learning space just to remind you to work on making a lot of deposits for the little people in the world. That's huge. Okay, I know we're running late and if you'll hang with me, we have one role play and then we're almost done, but I actually think that this role play is really awesome. So if there's two people, who would like to come up. We have a role play between a little boy and a mother, and they're playing. We're going to do one version when they're playing with some, um, one version where the parent hasn't really taken the pyramid parenting course, and one where she has, and I think it's really eye-opening just to see the difference. So, does anyone want to try it? I want to be the mom that has not taken the pyramid class. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Penny will be mom. Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to be Kenny, actually, is his name. Uh, anyone? Mm -hmm. Come on, Jessica. Yeah, Jessica, I think it has to be you. I just feel like you guys are the dynamic duo over there. And <laughs> you are the reigning Jeopardy. This is going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> what are you, what, you guys broccoli? Yeah. No, we're the two of Onion. 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 Okay, so we, yeah, you can take a minute to review. Our planner, she's going to read it. So we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to read A and then we'll read B. So first okay, so. A. So that's why you guys make such an exception to me, I'm telling you. <laughs> okay. Okay. See, right. I'm up here because I'm, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> See, right. a mom that hasn't taken pyramid, though, would not be on that floor. Yeah, well, you can stand. Go for it. Good idea. All right, ready? Mommy, roar! Roar! Okay. That's a snake. It's not a lion, and it doesn't roar. <laughs> well, my snake roars. It roars! Kenny, what does a snake say? Roar. 
Kenny, don't. <laughs> what does a snake say? Stop and listen. What does a snake say? Mine. Roars! <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Roars! <laughs> <laughs> No, this isn't right. The snake says hiss, not roar. And oh, okay. It makes the lion. Okay, so Kitty's making the lion walk and says, roar, roar. That's right. Is that where you move? Yeah. Yes. That's right. You got it, Kenny. That's what roars. What roars? And it says, do you know what a lion's doing? Oh, baby? yeah. What you said. <laughs> <laughs> baby? No, they're, they're called cups. They're lion cups. How many do you have, Kenny? Um, one, two, three! I have three! Nope, you missed one. Count them again. One, two, three! What's that one over there, oh, Kenny? Four. Mom, you be the lion's daddy. Here. This isn't a lion, Kenny. This is not a lion, Kenny. Well, oh, but it's the lion's daddy. No, no, this is a tiger. Nope. This is a tiger, Kenny. This is a lion. Do you see the difference? <laughs> is that for you? Well, no, I keep playing oh. and I don't answer. He turns okay. away from mom. Kenny, he uh, turns Kenny, away. Kenny, Kenny. And she's asking what color is it? What color is this, Kenny? Black and yellow. No, Kenny. Over here. You see this, Kenny? See? <laughs> what color is that? Alright, young man. <laughs> Kenny's mom has gone to the parenting class, and we're going to see how that interaction might look a little different. Alright. Okay, now we're on the floor, because I'm right. a good mommy now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kenny picks up a line. Crisscross applesauce. Oh, okay. Let's see. Hold on, I don't know where I am. Oh, here. Oh, you have a lion? That's a big lion. Is that a daddy lion? Do you know why he's a daddy lion, Kenny? Because he has a mane. Mm -hmm. A mane? Mm -hmm. That makes my lion go super fast. Oh, that makes that lion go really fast. Is he running? He's running. I wonder why he's running so fast, Kenny. He's trying to his friend's house. Oh my goodness. Is that a polar bear? Is that polar bear his friend, Kenny? Yes. Snake is his friend too. Remember the snake that roars? Roar. Oh yes, I can remember that snake that roars. <laughs> his friend the lion taught him how to roar. Oh wow, he must be a pretty special friend for that lion to teach him how to roar. Look, I see one, two, three snakes. Did the lion teach them to roar too? All yeah. of them? Yes, one, two, three. Three. He teaches all his friends how to roar. He taught me how to roar too. Roar! Oh, Do you I want agree. him to teach you how to roar? Mommy? Yes. Teach him. Teach me how to roar. I just love how you roar. Roar! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeopardy. <laughs> oh, so, if I think what did you notice? Know yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, what did you notice know about? The difference between the two. What happened in the second one? Oh, she totally followed his lead. He wanted to make this the snakes roar, so the snakes roared. And that they was were both really engaged with each other. It was really kind of stressful to watch the first time. Because she was asking him a ton of times. She was getting down to the academics of it. I can tell even just playing the the sun, like I, I was I was feel you know because like I was trying to like engage and instead of feeling engaged I was feeling you know like talked down to kind of but yeah. not yeah. like we really weren't on the same page at all. Yeah, and even I, them just reading it. Yeah, I was feeling it. frustrated with the reading. You know, I knew what I was like we were doing this thing. You know? <laughs> and it's funny because being the mom when you turned your back. Uh -huh. I wasn't even reading it, but I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I know 
Yeah, she's supposed to turn her back. <laughs> <laughs> and those are some visuals, I mean, things we can pick up on being detectives with kids. You know, maybe we start down that road of asking a lot of test questions and we can see we're losing them in these light bulb moments that we can rephrase things. Yeah, she took his lead. She, maybe she wanted to teach counting, so in the first one she was quizzing him. No, that's not right. But in the second one, she just did it. One, two, three. And then if so inclined, he counted two. So there's ways to still get to the same end point without grilling kids. So I thought it's a really great um, role play. This is a quick one. It's just another example of a toddler that's playing with, with their mom. And some nice skills, it's really short. It was that one you had. I think it's number five. Oh, I love that. There it is. So we're just going to watch a mom play with her little boy. It's kind of a long yeah. same lines. Let's see. 